It was July 16, 1945. The scientists of the Manhattan Project readied themselves to watch the detonation of the world's first atomic bomb. Nobody was prepared for the result. The bomb produced a blinding flash visible for 200 miles that lit up the morning sky. A mushroom cloud reached over 40,000 feet and the blast blew out civilians' windows from over 100 miles away. The world had entered the nuclear age. With this year's release of the film Oppenheimer, you may already know that World War II was responsible for birthing the atomic bomb. But did you know that this war played a significant role in developing video games? So, how are video games connected to the Second World War? Who invented the first video game? And what did they invent? Let's start with the technology that would later evolve into our PC entertainment centers. During World War II, there was an urgent need for technological advancement. The war effort required technology capable of code breaking and making ballistic calculations. This led to the development of early electronic computers called Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, ENIAC in the United States. The UK simply called it Colossus. And honestly, let's be real, Colossus is a way cooler name. The ENIAC demonstrated the concept of a programmable electronic machine capable of performing a wide range of tasks. It was also the first computer that operated on binary code, layering the foundation for future digital computing. Today, this binary system is used in gaming computers to process and display graphics, simulate physics, and perform calculations. Although the electronic computer worked better than the analog computers, there was a significant issue with its size. This monster took up 1,800 square feet of space and weighed 30 tons. That's the equivalent of three African bush elephants, the largest and heaviest land animal. Nowadays, our computers weigh about 35 to 80 pounds, about, you know, the size of a family dog. And like the family dog, it fits much easier through the front door. Advancement in radar technology was also crucial to detecting enemy aircraft and ships. This led to the creation of catheteray tube CRT technology used for radar displays. A CRT CRT is a specialized vacuum tube that produces images when an electronic beam strikes a phosphorescent surface. Think of these as first ever computer monitors. Can you imagine playing Fortnite on a five inch screen? Gross. Even after the war, there was a dire need to make computers more compact and more reliable. NIACs were insanely heavy and the CRTs had an extensive list of issues. Not only were they bulky, but they were fragile and big time power consumers. A lot of time and resources were spent on fixing these issues. By 1947, three scientists, John Bardeen, Walter Brayton, and William Shockley, created a small semiconductor device, the transistor. A transistor performed the same functions as the CRT vacuum tubes, but it was much smaller. Basically, it's a small switch that controls the flow of electricity into electronic devices. It's used to control electrical output. There's one more component I want to mention. Though created before World War II, it didn't become available for public purchase until after the war. And that is the joystick and controller. Yep, your controller has ancestors who fought in the war too. Joysticks and controllers were originally created to control aircraft, tanks, and motor vehicles. Later, they were repurposed and sold to civilians who used them for various computer experiments, and eventually this led to the game controllers we use today. Now that we've talked about important computer components that led to the creation of the first video game, let's talk about the creator. When envisioning video game creators, we picture video game artists like Hideo Kojima or Shigeru Miyamoto, writers, directors, and producers. We don't picture physicists who played a role in inventing the atomic bomb. And yet, that is precisely who is considered the godfather of video games. Meet William Higginbotham. Born in 1910, he was an American physicist from Bridgeport, Connecticut, whose expertise was in the fields of physics and, yep, nuclear weapons. 
but his passion was electronics. Remember the CRTs I mentioned earlier? Higginbotham was part of the team that made CRT displays for airborne, shipboard, and land-based radars in 1940. Three years later, he was recruited to lead the research and development team who designed components for the atomic bomb. His role did not win him a spot in Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, but he wasn't just some side character during the development. He helped develop the bomb's electronic amplifiers, counters, recorders, and timing circuits that controlled the bomb before the detonation. Though Higginbotham agreed to help design the atomic bomb, he did not see this project as one of his greatest achievements, nor was it something he wanted to help build in the first place. The only reason he helped make it was because he believed that he could help bring an end to the war that had already gone on for nearly four years years. And like many of the scientists who were actually involved in the Manhattan Project, Higginbotham regretted his life choices after witnessing the 1945 Trinity test, the first atomic bomb drop. In less than a year, he co-founded the Federation of American Scientists, FAS, advocating for responsible nuclear policies, arm control, and disarmament. Needless to say, his career in nuclear weapons had come to an abrupt end and instead focused on the idea of using nuclear energy for civilian purposes. Purposes. Two years later, Higginbotham started working at the Brookhaven Laboratory in Long Island, New York. He was finally getting back to his true calling, electronics. At Brookhaven, Higginbotham created electronic equipment for particle accelerators and digital computers. By the end of his career, he had patents on more than 20 different electronic circuits. It was in this position that he would become inspired to design the world's first video game. Brookhaven held an annual visitors event where the public could observe their scientific work. In 1958, Higginbotham, being head of the lab's instrumentation division, was given the responsibility of creating an exhibit to represent his department. His goal was to make an exhibit like no other. He wanted it to be exciting and interactive, something visitors had never seen or experienced. While brainstorming, Higginbotham came across an analog computer's manual for calculating bullet and missile trajectories. The book showed how to program the computer to emulate a bouncing ball. This gave him the idea to create an interactive game like tennis, where two people could play. For two hours, Higginbotham worked on developing the electrical schematics of this game. Then he passed it on to one of his engineers, Bob Dvorak, who spent the next two days constructing the game's design. The game was created to play on an analog computer using an oscilloscope. Oscilloscope? Oscilloscope? Oh my god! with a CRT screen. They also built square-shaped controllers to go with it. They kind of look like the Atari 2600 controllers from the 1980s. It took them a few days to put together the whole thing and test out the game to remove any bugs and issues. Once completed, Higginbotham officially created the world's video game Tennis for Two. On the screen, players could see a bright moving dot bouncing back and forth, and players controlled the ball's movement by hitting it with invisible rackets. And the game was a huge hit. The building couldn't even contain the line of eager people waiting to play. The game was so popular that the Brookhaven National Laboratory set up Tennis for Two again the following year, but this time they enhanced the experience. They set up a screen that was at least the size of the five inch that they used the previous year, plus the game had new playable options. Players could choose to play Tennis for Two with low gravity simulating the moon, or they could play with high gravity simulating Jupiter. Sadly, Tennis for Two never became more than a a fun retro exhibit that the Brookhaven National Laboratory would occasionally display during its annual visitor events. It's crazy to think that Higginbotham designed the first video game and didn't even make bank on it. At the time, the equipment needed to play Tennis for Two weighed a few hundred pounds, so it wasn't exactly something most consumers could carry or place in their homes. It could have been the first arcade game, but the first arcade wasn't invented until 1971. Even if Higginbotham had decided to patent the game, it technically belonged to the federal government. So the only reward he could have received would have been a pat on the back for making the government more money. Still, with his knowledge and skill in electronics, there's a chance he could have gone to create video games. 
but to Higginbotham, Tennis for Two was no more than a fun little exhibit. He had no idea that he invented a revolutionary product that would take the world by storm. Higginbotham did live long enough to see the development of video games up to the Sony PlayStation in 1993. So at least he had the opportunity to bear witness to the amazing world of digital entertainment that he inspired.